Okay, we're going to pray. And like we normally do, it's not just for the tithes and offerings, we're praying for Ida and Andrew serving us today. And so, Father, we say thank you for two beautiful people who carry such power, such presence. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that flows through both of them. And I pray, Father, for this week, your Spirit will reach out through them and touch and heal lives, encourage and restore. Father, we thank you that you place your voice within us and I want to pray that this week, Father, in both of them, your voice will go out and move mightily. May your kingdom be loved, blessed, encouraged and grown through both. Father, we thank you for tithes and offerings and this opportunity for us to give back and sow back and we pray, Father, that you'll continue to sustain all the needs of this church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to church today. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody. And as you guys know, we treat that phrase as a prophetic phrase and not just a throwaway phrase. Thank you, Laura. I want to welcome some very special people into church this morning. I haven't seen, well, I haven't seen Jen for th over 30 years. So 30, probably 30 years and six months ago or something like that, Trish and Jen turned up in this church to do a three-month mission with the youth of this church. There's one other one, his name is Dan, and uh, we're still trying to twist his arm to get him over here to Australia as well. But uh, 30 years, six or seven months ago, I was leading, I was part of the youth leadership, and I got on with Trish so well, I married her. And, um, <laughs> but Jen was very much a part of that time and a part of that group, and since then, you got married to Mark, I haven't met you yet, only on Facebook. Uh, just want to say how welcome you guys are, uh, your family, uh, you've always been, even though a whole generation seems to have come and gone, not gone, have come. and uh, I don't know how many kids you got, three, isn't it awesome to have three kids, back to this pool. One of the things we do in this church is prophesy, and I just want to just take a moment to pray and prophesy for both of you, if that's okay. That's rhetorical. Uh, that's not good. But it just fills my heart with joy to see you guys back. And when Sharon said to me that you, you're coming and just going to be here for a short period of time, one, I can't wait to spend lunch time with you guys, but uh, it just really blessed my heart to know that you're back in this very building where you did something so significant for the kingdom of God all those years ago. We're ready to pray for them. So for those who don't know Jen, she's sitting beside my sister Sharon. Uh, just encourage you to meet her after the service because again, many things that Trish and Jen sowed into this church all those years ago are still very much present inside of this place. When they both turned up with Dan 30 years ago, they had a real heart for evangelism and uh, they really spoke uh, and they lived it. And so whenever you hung out with them, there was this real joy and this love that flowed through them. And uh, so if you get a chance to hang out with, with Jen after the service, come down and have a cup of coffee with us. We do real coffee in this. We do not do Americanas, nor we do have instant coffee. I'm sorry to say that, and I just confess that to you. I keep throwing those bottles out, but somehow they keep turning back up. But um, I, we will make you a real coffee. So I want you guys to pray with me. And as we do in this church, we don't just check out when I start praying. You actually check in. So I'm just going to leave a bit of silence, and if you've got a word on your heart for either Jen or for Mark, I just want you to speak it out quite loud so that I can hear it at least and repeat it, um, or that they can hear it. So if you just want to just spend some time asking God for a word for these two and their three kids maybe, because um, you guys are the grandparents, right? Not yet. Yet is our prophetic word, right? <laughs> Not yet. That's what I'm saying too, Jen. So uh, let's just spend some time praying. If you've got a word for them, please feel free to just to speak it out loud.
Christ. The Spirit is upon you to bring you favour. Kingdom people and sound break. Doing a new thing. So, Father, we want to bring all of those words together and to say the ones that are here with us that are full of joy, full of hope, pioneers of the kingdom, leaders in the kingdom. I have a vision for you both, where I see the path that you're walking down, and as you walk, a new life happens as you walk. And so, the Father is can. Is calling you not to give up and not to let go. There is new life that is flowing with you as you step forward in faith. More life will flow from you. And so, Father, my own heart fills with joy to see Jen back in this place. And that's just from a relational point of view. We just want to say thank you for her marriage to Mark, the three brilliant humans that they that you have created through them and the life that they have given to them. And so, Father, today we want to pray your richest blessing into overflow of love and grace and peace. We thank you, Father, for the favour that you've placed upon them and the words that have been spoken into them. And I pray that this day for them will be a, such a significant day of the kingdom of God. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we ready for the word of God? Yep. Very ready. You got your Bibles there? I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to look at verses 14 down to verse 17. Matthew chapter 9, it says, One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, Why aren't your disciples fasting like we do? And the Pharisees do. Jesus replied, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Someday the groom will be taken away from them and they, then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? But the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into an old wineskin, for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skin. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. I want to speak this morning about new wine. Every uh, start of the year, January, the first Sunday, one of the things that we do is we speak about vision for the coming year. It's something that I've traditionally done, but this year I think is a little bit different. I think the season and the time that we are walking through right now as a nation is so significant for what is about to be. Part of the, the church world, if you listen prophetically to what's happening around the world, you'll have a lot of people talking about God's judgment on Australia right now. You'll hear people talking about God's renewal on Australia right now, and you go, well, who's right? Who's wrong? And often, depending upon your own position, you'll go, it's judgment. Or you'll go, no, 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 it's actually God's renewal on us. So I want to talk a little bit about that because I don't believe that it's about 2020 that the Father is calling us into. I think it's the season the Father has us a part of. And to understand where we're heading, you've got to look to where we've been to know where we are. Does that make sense? If you've been in this church for long enough, you've heard me use that phrase before. If you want to know where God is taking you, you've got to know where you've come from to know where you are, to look to see where God is taking you forward to. He leads you from where you've been to where you are to take you further forward. Let me explain that if you don't understand that. Patricia and I, who have gone through 30 years of marriage, and at one point of that, it nearly felt like it was about to fall apart. But the Father in heaven... And our own commitment to each other, tomorrow we're about to celebrate 30 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. I praise God for that. I praise my wife for that. Uh, and I just believe that what the Father has done is he's led us through a place where we can bring hope into hopeless places. 
That is our story. That is our song. That is who we are. That is what we do. If we ignored our past, if we forgot our past, if we got rid of our past, we would be getting rid of what God has done. And if I get rid of what God has done, I lose my story. I lose my testimony. I lose my song. And I've got to start all over again. And so when people are going, God, what is in front of me? What, we have, what I believe you first have to do is to see what is behind you. To know what you've overcome in life. So you can stand to know what you've been led forward into in life. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. As part of the journey that I think of the kingdom of God in each and every one of us. Often you'll hear preachers say, forget the past. The Apostle Paul himself at one point says, I forget the past and strive for what is future. What he has never been able to forget, though, is what God has done in him. And so when you read the story of Acts, you will hear the Apostle Paul telling his story, telling his story, and telling his story. He has not forgotten what God has done for him. What he has let go of is the fear and the shame and the guilt of where he was. Are you with me? For every one of us inside of this room, there are probably things inside of your world and life that Satan will love for you to be drawn back to, to sit within, to say that you are not worthy to stand where you are. You have no right or access to pray for the things that you do. But in every part of that, Jesus wants to meet that argument. He wants to undo that argument. He wants to heal that argument. And then he wants to speak the truth through you. Is that an amen moment? That could be an amen moment right there. Amen. It's that thing within each of us, if we understand where God has taken us to where we are, that is our testimony. And the Bible says Satan himself cannot overcome you with your testimony and the power of the blood of Christ. So how important is it to know from where you've come from and not be ashamed of it? And so the, the concept for me of God, what God is doing right now amongst us in our, in our nation is a bigger conversation than is God judging us or is God blessing us? I don't know of anyone who doesn't know somebody who has been touched by this fight. My own auntie, my dad's sister, is out of a house right now in Jindabyne. She's hoping to go back to it this afternoon and she's hoping it's still there. There's so many stories inside of this room of how this one catastrophe has affected and impacted our nation. I want to speak a little bit more about that in a bit. But I want to speak about this concept of the new wine. Being raised in a Baptist church, we didn't have any new wine. We had no wine. We had no old wine. No aged. It was a shock of my life when I opened up my, my dad's cabinet a few years ago and found a bottle of brandy. And he tells me he uses it for cooking. <laughs> and so for me, learning about new wine and old wine when I was a kid, I didn't really understand it. I didn't get it. I didn't know it because I'd never tasted it. And, I, and as, a, as a kid being raised in the home that I was, pretty much I was never going to taste that because if I tasted that stuff, I was going to be a sinner. That's called a tradition. A man-made tradition. So when Jesus comes along and speaks about the new wine, this is a new idea. If you look back at the Old Testament, time and time and time again, this phrase of new wine comes up again and again and again. I Google it thinking there'd be one or two. There's about 30 or 40 occurrences where God is speaking about the new wine in the Old Testament. So if you think this is something new for Jesus to be speaking about, it's not. It's the concept that when the, the new wine happens, it's every season the grapevines are giving a new harvest. Every season. And the Father's saying, I'm showing to you my faithfulness by the new wine that has been produced every season. It's locked in with God's faithfulness in what he does, in who he is. There's something about the new wine that he brings it. Jesus here is not telling us to drink new wine because anyone who drinks wine understands that old wine tastes better than new wine. Is that true? Generally, I was given a 10-year-old bottle the other day for my birthday and I waited for, for uh, my, my daughter's partner to come up from Melbourne to drink it with him and I tasted it and I thought, this tastes like vinegar. 
and the ten dollar bottle I got from Woolworths seems to taste better than this. So maybe my palate is just not on point with this kind of thing. But generally speaking, if we understand the culture that we're in, the older wine tastes better than the new wine. And you'll see in this analogy, Jesus is not calling us to drink of it. He's telling us how it is stored. And so we have this concept from the Old, Old Testament of God speaking over and over his, to his people. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God says to his people, I'm creating with you a covenant of unfailing love. I love that phrase. Marriages should be covenants of unfailing love. Is that right? Are we okay with that? Unfailing love. God's love for us is unfailing. It has never failed. It has never stopped failing. And sometimes we feel like we're disappointed. And sometimes we think, God, would you please do this for us? But the concept with God is it's never stopped failing. Why? Because he's never stopped investing in us. That is how you show love, is how you invest in another person. If you are not investing in another person, are you really loving them? Or are you just putting up with them? And so here's God. My covenant to you is of unfailing love. And he promises to love us and to bless us. Is that good? Amen. To love us and to bless us. What on earth does that mean? Well, fortunately, God tells us. He says to us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, there's fertility in the land and in the animals. You will have a place that you can call home. There'll be harvest. There'll be new wine. There'll be olive oil. There'll be herds. Um, and again, it goes on to speak of it, how that nation's going to be a blessing for all other people. I'm asking you the question this morning, are you a blessing for all other people? Are you a blessing for all other people? Well, the answer is, it can be, yes, depending on how you love, I guess. And so this motif of the new wine flows throughout the Old Testament. And it comes to this place of the New Testament where John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus and they ask him the question, why aren't your disciples fasting like we're fasting? Maybe they're hungry. Maybe Jesus is not fasting. Maybe they're sick and tired of fasting. Anyone enjoy fasting? It's where the crickets chirp in the room, right? <laughs> so they ask Jesus this question, and as Jesus does, he answers their question with another question. Do wedding guests mourn while, the ce while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They celebrate with the groom. So there's no fasting happening at any kind of wedding that I've ever been to. If you came to a wedding and the, and the groom and the bride told you we're going to fast... That'd be a new concept, right? <laughs> then he says, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? Does anyone patch that clothing anymore? Jeff, Jeff you patch, still patch your clothing? Wait, <laughs> seamstress in the room. Or a tailor. I should say tailor, not seamstress. <laughs> tailor in the room. Tailor. But Jesus says, uh, for a new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even, even bigger tear than before. And again, then he says another metaphor. He says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine, ruining the skins, and new wine is stored in new wineskins, so both are preserved. Didn't really answer the question. And so the disciples are still there scratching their heads as to saying, Jesus, what are you talking about? And so if you go back into the Old Testament, God is doing something new to show his faithfulness through the concept of the new wine. And I wonder whether today we could believe that if there is a new wine moment that we're in, that God is showing to us his faithfulness right now. Even though when we look outside and look on the news, it looks like a catastrophe. I wonder what the Father is on about. And so here's Jesus, and he's asked the question about fasting, and he brings them into a bigger conversation about what it means to be a follower of Christ, because things are now starting to happen which are different than you've ever happened before. How does that happen? Well, the next story that's in the Bible in Mark chapter 9 is about Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, who comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus because his daughter has died. This is a new wine moment. Let me explain to you. 
Up until this point, as a Jewish leader in the synagogue, for him to associate with Jesus would have him ostracized by his co-workers, his friends, and quite possibly not allowed back into the temple. He had to break something cultural to get into that moment with Jesus. And he's asking of something of Jesus that he is not asking of his own religion. Maybe he has asked of his own religion, and it's come back as zero. Maybe he has asked for a question, would you even pray for my daughter? And nobody has been in that place to do that. So he has come to Christ to do something that is beyond what other people would think was normal. So Jesus was the son of a carpenter. He was nobody trained. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Galilee. And people, even his own disciples said, what good things are actually going to come out of Nazareth? Fortunately, they changed their mind on that one. And so there's Jesus with Jairus in front of him and says, Will you come to my home to heal my daughter? Now, for girls in the first century, it didn't seem to be as important as guys. And so you have a Jewish religious leader who's putting his whole career on the line to reach out to somebody who is from some backwater of Nazareth to come to his home to touch his daughter to raise her back to life again. Can you not see that something new is actually happening in the kingdom of God when religion gets placed to the left and relationship starts moving forward? This is the new wine moment that we are in today where religion has been left and relationship with the Father has been now empowered. This is a new wine moment. What does Jesus do? He says, yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'm healing. Yes, I'm doing this relationship thing. On the way there, a woman reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And once again, a new wine moment starts flowing because healing starts flowing into this woman. Where Jesus says, I feel faith has gone out from me. I feel power has gone out from me. What has happened? A woman has reached out in faith to the one who could heal her. And in that moment, the religion was put to the side and faith was led forward. And you have a moment where the new wine is now seen. The new wine is tangible. It is no longer a metaphor. You see, I think Christians, we spend so, so long and so often in the metaphor, we never get to the tangible moment of the kingdom of God. I say this to people all the time when they come and say, man, I'm going through a dark valley right now. I go, okay, let me hear what that is because I want to understand what that is because all you're giving to me right now is a metaphor of what you're going through. And if you want to know healing, you've got to come from the metaphor into the place of revelation. Jesus would use the metaphor. He would use the story. He would use the parable to lead people to a place of revelation. But if we just stay in the metaphor, we stay in the invitation. We don't come to the table for the feast. Are you with me? And so again, with our own world and our own lives, we talk about things in the metaphor all the time. But I believe that we are in a time now where people are now looking for the tangible outworking of the Holy Spirit inside of their lives. They're not looking for a way of life. They are looking for transformation. They are looking for transformation that looks like relationship. It does not look like religion. It looks like love. It does not look like law. I just believe the season that we're in is starting to change and to shift. And I think the Father is doing something so significant through the catastrophe of the things that are happening around us. People say to me all the time, did God send the fire to us? Did God send the fire? Did God send the fire? I know right back in Genesis 1 and 2, God said this to us, I'm giving you dominion over creation. And it's entrusted us to look after it. So I'm just passionate about it. And so when people say, why won't God fix it? I believe he's inviting us into a relationship where we walk with him. And not this robotic moment where he just fixes everything for us when things get too hard. Because what I have found is that when the Father works in and through people, life and love start happening together. Here's an example. I have a friend of mine down in Lake Conjola. She she part-time pastors a church up here in Sydney. So she's up here three days a week, but she lives down in Lake Conjola. This last week for her, the last seven days have been catastrophic. You know when you hear the news and you hear words in media and you wonder how true it is? 
And I think that's some of the trouble that we deal with as a society because we have such a, a media that wants to emphasize everything way beyond the truth that when we start seeing truth, we don't actually know if it is. And so this past week, I sent her a message and I said, Hey, Chris, how's it going? Um, just really thinking, praying for you right now. I wonder how it's, things are going down for you in Lake Conjola. And she sends me back this quite a long text of how things are going. And I saw her on Facebook yesterday and she's got black soot all over her face. Her hair is out here. She has worked so hard to protect her house but is still standing. But she said this. There are two things that have occurred through these bushfires that have been happening. And as hard as they are and as traumatic as they are, people are praying. People are praying. People who don't normally pray are now praying. We've been told that the only way that these fires are going to be put out now is if it burns out of fuel or it starts raining. And so we're now completely out of our own control and into the Father in Heaven's control. And so what are people doing? They are praying. They are having a conversation with the Father and they're looking to have a conversation with the Father. And for us as believers in Christ, we should be empowering these conversations. We should be championing these and being a cheerleader for these conversations. We should be encouraging people when they are praying to start looking for outcomes. I get contacted in this very morning from people in America who are saying, how are the things going with the fires? We can see that there is rain forecast for you this afternoon. I got out my own app and I saw 30%. And as you all know, 30% pretty much means 0% these days. And then I look for tomorrow and 70% chance of tomorrow, okay? And there's 20% chance on Tuesday. And I wrote back and I said, that's, that's cool and we would love any rain that we can get, but we kind of need at least a week of drenching rain. And if we can get that week of drenching rain, we'll start to be on top of what we actually are starting to look like as a drought. And, and so again, it's not just about having a rain session, it's now a rain season. And, and this is the place of the waymaker that we've just been seeing into being, that we're now starting to speak and to pray and to be at one with the kingdom of God and we have a society now that is starting to shift and starting to turn and praying for rain is starting to become something that has been on people's lips that has not been on their lips for a long time I take that as a significant moment in the kingdom of God the second thing which I think is even as important I was going to say more but you make up your own mind and judge me whichever way you want um, is that she said that the community is coming together. The community is coming together. They are sharing an experience that will bind them together for the rest of their lives. They are bound together with one purpose. There is survival that's part of that and what's happening is relationship is occurring for that. And so the Father, I believe in heaven, is using such a catastrophe that we find ourselves in to bring something of his kingdom to flow from it that are coming in the most surprising and the most unusual ways. The Bible says that his ways and his thoughts and plans are above what we can hope, dream, think or imagine. And so if you're asking me to fully explain what God is doing right now, understand I will be woefully short of what God is actually doing. We live in a nation that needs fire creation to regenerate. What I believe prophetically for the season that we're in, when these fires go out and these rains come, we now look for what the Father is doing. You've got your Bibles there, I want you to open up to Joel chapter 2. Yesterday I was sitting with God on this very thing because I don't know about you, but I've been praying for rain. Thursday night we were driving home from Lisa's place and the windscreen got a few spits on it. I'm praising God just for a few spits of rain, but I'm saying, Father, release, release, and still there is nothing. That's what the Father shared with me yesterday. Are we okay to say in this room that the, the Word of God is living and alive? Amen. It's breathing and it's for every generation. Are we okay to say that? If you are okay to say that, stand with me in faith in this. Verse 21 says, don't be afraid of my people. Anytime God says that to his people, there is a reason to be afraid. Got it? God does not say do not fear something if there's nothing to fear. So he's saying to the people through the, apostle, through the prophet Joel, do not be afraid of my people. Be glad now and rejoice. I love that challenge. That in the face of fear, I can still choose to be glad and rejoice. Is anyone up for that this morning? 
Okay, that's an attitude of faith. That's a step of faith. And the Bible says anytime God sees faith, his pleasure is upon those moments. That's Hebrews chapter 11. Be glad now and rejoice for the Lord has done great things. We're okay to say that? He has done great things. He is doing great things. He will be doing great things. Here's the second time. Do not be afraid. It's now a theme. You animals of the field, he even speaks to his creation. For the wilderness pastures will soon be green. Who's up to receive that? The wilderness pastures will soon be green. The trees again will be filled with fruit. Fig trees and grapevines will be loaded down once more. Here it is again. It's another theme. Rejoice, you people of Jerusalem or God's people. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Here it is. Once more, the autumn rains will come as well as the rains of spring. The next season that we are in physically is the autumn rain. And I want to, I don't know, no, it's not, it's probably not our rainy season whatsoever. I don't know a whole, whole heap about that sort of stuff. But I just read that this morning and I, yesterday and I heard God say that it's coming. It's coming. Then verse 24, the threshing floors will again be piled high with grain and the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. The Lord says, I will give you back to you what you have lost. So think about this. Grain is now going to be overflowing. So what is grain? That is bread. That is the word of God is going to be overflowing. The new wine is going to be overflowing. That's again the example of God's faithfulness to us. And we're about to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what that new wine actually looks like. And then finally the olive oil is going to overflow as well, which is often connected with healing inside of the kingdom of God. So I wonder whether this morning we can believe prophetically for the season that we are in is one of healing, is one of the blood of Christ where he has cleansed and purified and released us from every sin and now his word is speaking once again in ways that we have not yet heard it. Could that be the moment of the season of the new wine that is here? That's straight from Joel. If you go to Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter takes part of Joel chapter 2 and he says this, And after doing all these things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. That's happened. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That's happening and happened today. Your old men will dream dreams. Old men? Dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Good thing I'm still seeing visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. I will cause wonders in the heaven, on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But all who call on my name will be saved, be delivered, be set free. Here's Jesus. He's just asked this simple question. Should we be fasting? And he says, I'm doing something new right now. It's 2,000 years ago. We would call that old, right? Yeah, we would. 2,000 years ago, he said, I'm starting something new. And right in today, in this season, he's doing that something new again. We are seeing a whole nation right now being impacted. And right now is this opportunity for the love of God to flow in places that has never flowed before. The grace of God to move in ways that has never flowed before. The mercy of God to move in ways that has never flowed before. So for me, what is this new wine? If I could put it quite simply, I'm done with religion. I'm done with it. I'm now about relationship with the Father. The relationship I have with my heavenly dad is one of freedom, life, Grace, forgiveness, honour, integrity, power, miracles. He has given to us that authority to step into that place as an invitation. To live from that, we've got to move from religion of what we need to do to get things right to who we are in the fire. How are we going with that so far? Rochelle's going great. I'm going to get Laura to come up and play. We're going to be singing a song at the end here. It's called, and you guys know it's called New Wine. 
probably 18 months ago this song was first debuted in a Hillsong service. And I believe so often our songwriters are prophets. And 18 months ago when this song hit us as a church, it started impacting the way that we do church. And as a pastor, I look for those things. I look for the songs that move us. This week, Lisa was talking about the song Waymaker to us. She says it's another song that has moved our church. Why does one or two songs do this to us and some do not? Why? Because there is something inside of these tunes that bring us to a greater revelation, the kingdom of God. So we can sing of the metaphor, but we are now led to the revelation. What is that revelation for you? What is that revelation that the Father wants to speak into your life today? If you're here today and your family is with you or your friend of, of people that are part of your family, think about the generational moment of the kingdom of God that's actually occurring right in this room right now. So we've got one dad with three sons over here and Yusuf and three brilliant men of God. And I declare that over the three of you. James, you carry such grace inside of your spirit. And I believe that the Father is going to use you to bring the love of God to not only your, your friends, but to the generations that are around you, back to your Father. Matt, I keep prophesying over you. You are a leader in the kingdom of God. The Father has commissioned you already. And that your peers already see that and they are led to you by that. Nathan, I believe that the compassion and empathy of the King of Kings is inside of you. I think lives will be touched by those that you love. Lives will be transformed. So do not be discouraged right now. Be encouraged for what the Father is doing inside your life. And Yusuf is the man of God. I watched this man come alive when we were in Beirut. I watched the Father speak into his heart, to his spirit. I watched when words disappeared and his heart started being seen. And ever since then, I've seen God use this man of God for great things in the kingdom. People talk to me now about your peace and your joy. People who don't even really know you, but they say, who is that guy who carries such peace and joy of the kingdom of God? And we have that inside of a family unit that is right here in this place. We prophesy over a brilliant couple from Texas. We don't even know your kids, but all of a sudden the church is reaching out and calling forward things of the kingdom of God over their lives. This is the kingdom of God. This is the new wine. This is taking it from the metaphor and into the place of revelation. We can talk about new wine. We can joke about the metaphors of new wine. But when we start speaking it in a place of identity and transformation, before you know it, things start shifting and changing around you in the lives that you are actually impacting, in the relationships that are key inside of your life, and the Father starts drawing more relationships to you. We are not designed to be lonely. Do you get that? We are not designed to be lonely. We are designed to be in community. We are designed to love each other. We are designed to care for each other. And here the Bible says God is love. And so every single time you love, you see something of God. And so when people tell you they can't see God, point them to love and they will see God. Do you understand? It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. We don't need to have a degree in theology to understand these things. We just need to love. This past week, I did a Facebook Live with Lana, and I spoke of a message that we, I used here a couple of weeks ago when little Ellie spoke of what was going on inside of her heart. She's six years old. And I spoke to that Facebook Live. There's over 14,000 people have watched this story of Ellie. And what, did, what happened is I invited Jesus into this room and I said to the church, where is Jesus and what is he doing? This little hand goes up from the back of the church. It's Ellie. I said, Ellie, where has Jesus touched you? My heart. My heart. It's hard to say that without getting emotional because I love that little girl so much. But there, all of a sudden, what I watched was the love of Jesus go generational. 
because there are grandparents inside of this room are being touched by a child who is now speaking of the encounter that they have had with Jesus. We have a mother and a father in this room that has been touched by the tangible expression of the love of Jesus all because a six-year-old girl decided to go, I can see Jesus in the room. And when she saw Jesus, what did he do? He didn't condemn her. He didn't put her down. He didn't tell her she was a sinner. He spoke to the heart that was there. And she welcomed him. We are no longer in metaphor. We are now in reality. We are now in the kingdom of God. Jesus told us when we pray, we've got to pray this way. He says, may your kingdom come on earth as has been done in the heavens. That's our prayer. Jesus then came to earth and then he did all these things. And he said, if these things are happening, the kingdom of heaven is here. Let me just say again, the kingdom of heaven is here. So here's how we're going to finish. Uh, Ida and Andrew are going to come forward and they're going to give to you the communion. So you stay where you are. They're going to have a, a tray of cups and a plate. And I want you to take it and drink and put the cup back in the plate. Does that make sense? It's a little different from what we normally do. We're, but we're done with religion, right? And we're now in a relationship. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask Lord, the Lord's blessing on that. And so again, when we talk about the word blessing, it's not just Father blessed. Father, your presence is on this stuff. And as you receive this food or this little tiny drink, it's the presence of the Father in heaven, which is his great love that was poured out for us through Jesus Christ. When his life was sacrificed, he said, I'm giving my body as the bride of Christ. It's not broken, but here it is. And then he spoke about the grape juice being of it, like his blood, that for the forgiveness of sin, we needed a blood sacrifice. And Jesus stepped forward and says, here I am. So this morning, as we finish and we start singing this song called New Wine, I want you to take of both the grape juice and the bread. Receive them both right there. Place it back. So this is going to take a little bit of time. As we do it, I might get Lisa to come up and sing. Or who's singing New Wine? I might get one singer. Like, I don't mind. That awkward moment as to... Who dances what? I don't care if we get two singers. There's no condemnation for those in the kingdom of God, right? It's not going to upset me. So where's Ida? Where's Andrew? Come on down. Let me just pray as they do that. There's the beautiful Ellie. Just come into the room. The handsome Mitch at the back of the room. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you for the children that are inside of this room. And as I pray that prayer, I hear, Father, you in heaven saying, you're all my children. Every one of us. His. His creation being formed and created in his own son's image and being transformed into his glory. All because of what Christ has done. And so Jesus, welcome into this room and thank you for your great sacrifice for us. We believe we believe in the blood of Christ, your blood. We believe in what you accomplished and did. We believe in your resurrection. We believe. And so, Father, today, as we take of both the grape juice and the bread, we come with a heart of gratitude and say thank you, Father, for the season of the new wine that you've placed us in. But, Father, today, we don't stay in metaphor. We come to that place of reality. We are not in religion. We are in relationship. So, Father, we say thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just feeling really led on my heart to just to pray for another family right here. Steve and Chris, is that right? Stephen and Chris. They're just visiting with us for the day. Their own church community at East Lara. Jasper is in recess. And I just, but they've been on my heart just to want to prophesy for them too. So I just wonder if we just take a moment, ask God for a word and speak it over this family. Peaceful. Peaceful. 
faithful, loving. Togetherness. Dedication. Dedication. Blessed. Loving and provision. Canopy over them, and you guys are a canopy. It shows the faith that you carry as a family. God's love. God's love. <laughs> Healing love. And you hear the word love being repeated over you guys time and time again. We believe that when the Father repeats himself, he gives us that theme, and that's the emphasis on your family, that the love of God is on you. As you go back into your own church environment community, we have this belief here that there is only one church. So uh, as you guys go back into your expression of church, that the love of God is going to drive fear out of that place and out of the hearts of the people that surround you guys. Your own family is built on the strength of love. And so again, we just believe that this season for you guys, this is a time of growth, this is a time of change and a time of transition. Don't resist it. Just allow the love of God to do what only He can do. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable. Sometimes you wonder what it looks like it means. And sometimes it just hurts. Uh, I think love at times is we rather have it without the hurt. But the Father teaches us and grows us in it. And so as a family, even when it hurts, the Father is doing something significant that of restoration upon you. So Father in heaven, we say thank you for Stephen and Chris and our brilliant family that is here with us today. We pray, Father, that as the heavens are open over us and we believe that continually, we just thank you, Father, for the glory that shines down upon them. We pray, Father, that this, these 12 months that are ahead of them where they love, that you will show them time and time again of how tangible, how powerful and how life-changing it is, the design that God has placed them together as a marriage and as a family. And so, Jesus, today, would you carry them through this day? Would you empower them with your love? In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just finish by this. Happy New Year. I feel like it's a really cheap statement of what we've just been a part of, right? If you want to give to the Bushfire Appeal, please just drop some money in the back. If you're not going to repair and you still want to give through us, you can do that online. Just put in the reference plate, Bushfire, and we'll get make sure it gets passed on. In this church, we believe that any time a child cries out, that's a moment of life, a place of prophecy, a place of God's goodness. It's not a place of interruption or disappointment or condemnation. All those things have been driven out by the love of God. Amen? Amen. So we are not a people that brings condemnation. We are a people that brings love. This is the new wine that is here. Jesus said, I am not pouring new wine into old wineskins. I believe with all of my heart that the Father is destroying old wineskins. So what he's pouring out now is pouring into the lives and the hearts of believers. That ones that are designed to carry it and to live from it. In that place of love. I believe that the Lord is putting a new robe upon us. He's not patching up an old robe that will just tear when, when we go through the washing and stuff like that. It's actually something brand new. He's declaring over his people what I have declared clean. Let no one declare unclean. And I believe that we are his bride. I believe that as he sees us, so we are. And the Bible says that we are undefiled. That is what Christ's death has done for us. We are undefiled. We are wearing new clothes. We are a new vessel that the Father is filling us to overflow. And so, Father, today we pray for that overflow to happen in this moment and from this moment. And so, Father, for the days that are ahead of us, may we know where we have come from to understand where we are. And as we understand where we are, we are now pointed in the direction of where you are leading. And so, Father, where there has been hopelessness, we declare hope. Where there has been faithlessness, we declare faith. Where there has been no, no love, we declare that you are already there. 
You are already present. You are already here. And Father, let your love flow now. And so we say thank you, Lord, for what is about to be. Thank you for the new wine. Thank you for the rain that is going to fall from the heavens. Thank you for the fires that we've put out. But thank you, Father, for this new time of revelation. And so, Father, we go from metaphor to revelation. Father, reveal yourself to us in this day. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.